Hello, and welcome to Arts and Entertainment. With Chris and Randall. I'm Chris. I'm Randall. And welcome to uh, another installment of, I think this is part four, right, Randall? <laughs> yeah, this is going to be part four of the, the Hitler cycle. <laughs> part of the art cycle. Uh, this is part four of our uh, what we had started uh, with Impressionism, then we moved to Post-Impressionism, and I believe the point is really the beginning of when non-represent, we're really dealing with the, the rise of non-representational art and its implications from the 19th century to the 20th, correct? Maybe and, should, yeah, maybe we should call this the birth of the modern world because that's what it really comes down to. Yeah, and we're dealing with this particular thing where modernity and, 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 a, and a visual aesthetic. Now, this you can't take this class for college credit, so you're just, um, and I'm certainly hoping that you are listening to this or watching this uh, in its continuity because we had a few weeks off between these. Now, before I get any further, as always, uh, please like, share, subscribe. Uh, Randall, what's a good way to uh, reach us? Well, just look at our website, kristenrandall.com. There's various ways to reach us there. And uh, also, you can check out our Facebook page, Arts Entertainment with Chris and Randall. Uh, some uh, discussion on there. All right. Well, we really appreciate your comments. They really inform the quality of the show. I never thought we would do four or five episodes on just one topic <laughs> on such a deep dive. I'm glad we're doing it. Uh, and I'm really grateful for the encouragement that we have gotten from our viewers and listeners. Speaking of listening and viewing, if you are viewing right now, hey, check out the new logo right behind us. I know it looks a lot like the old logo because we're subtle that way, but entertainment now has a, like a full line right behind it. And if you're listening, I think you'll soon notice that the logo for the show, right, Randall, will also change to the new logo. So that's some cool that's stuff. Really now, if you are listening, um, this is another tough episode because we're looking at paintings. So I will do my best to describe what we're looking at and promise you that there will be enough oral content that if you cannot see, we'll certainly give you the name of the painting so you can Google and then you can, you know, Google along with us or you can just listen to the text. And with that, Randall, uh, where were we left off? Okay. Well, <clears throat> I told you a little bit about this show already when I wanted to cover like weeks ago, but hopefully you forgot because I think uh, this is going to be a fun show for you, Chris. Uh, you're going to get to see some really weird stuff. Um, uh, so just if you have any questions or anything, let me know. So I just want to do a, a brief recap. Um, so in 1863 in, in Paris, you have the Salon des Refuses, which is like an alternative art show. And then 1874, uh, Impression, Sunrise by Monet is painted, which is the first, uh, it coins the term Impressionism, which starts off this whole process probably. Um, well, it comes after the Salon des Refuses because he already had Impressionism. Uh, but what you're looking at right now, Chris, is the, uh, the Blue Rider. This is uh, the Blue Rider by Kandinsky. I believe the year is 1903. And this is the origin painting that begins the whole Blue Rider movement, which actually began uh, one of our previous episodes, in case you're wondering if this is a repeat. No, this is the second time <laughs> we've opened up with this painting because it's seminal to our argument. Well, what's going on in this episode is this is kind of like an appendix episode to the last episode. So in the last episode, we talked about the, uh, the abstract moment. That's the moment the modern world was born when Kandinsky paints the first uh, abstract, truly abstract painting ever in human history, apparently. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, I mean, so we went through in the last episode, we went through like his evolution, how he got there. Um, and it seems like, it seems like, doesn't, didn't it, Chris, that, uh, there was a certain progression, right? Okay. So it starts with the blue rider. He, you can see this this uh, painting. We d discussed it at length before. It's um, it's groping towards a non-figurative uh, uh, form of art, but but you can see it's still mired in f figurative art. Um, this painting starts like a whole movement, and Kandinsky starts a, a group called the Blue Rider Group, and 
and there's all these fine artists trying to like uh, come up with something that's uh, that's new. <laughs> They're trying to and again, the modern if you world. have not, uh, if you're new to this particular episode, what we're looking at is what is a ra- ra- rather murky painting of uh, we're outside in a green field or hill, and on the lower uh, lo- middle maybe uh, right hand corner is a man on a horse he's wearing a blue cloak casting a blue shadow on a white horse he's riding on a green hill uh, which takes up three quarters of the painting then on the upper top we see both trees and then we see uh, the sky so there's a lot of blue it's the dominant color in it but also everything here is slightly out of focus so that you're left again more with an impression of it it has a a particular kind of mood as well from the muting of the colors all right let's go on so this is another kandinsky 1908 so this is like uh what is this this is um it's a five years uh, later he's painted right and we have covered this one before right again this one was house in uh munich and it is a a row of buildings uh right again uh, a city street Muted colors, the dominant colors being a yellow and an orange and rust. These are very autumnal colors, but their saturation is so high that they're, you could almost argue they're ugly, uh, but if nothing else, they're very disturbing. Well, I just, my point is, uh, you can see he's gone from the Blue Rider to this in five years. It's taken him five yeah. years, and there's not a lot of intellectual conceptual improvement i would say or i would disagree that it's an improvement it just it's clearly i feel like he's still exploring the theme of of of, a, of an expressionistic quality of a of an of with a foreboding emotional seal it's still figurative however all right it is go. absolutely still figurative though. okay You're let's correct. go on so okay so now look kandinsky paints this in 1909 the next year now, you see there's like a huge – I feel like there's a huge difference between these paintings, wouldn't you right. say? Right. Now, for those of you who are just listening, it's the dark shadow of a train at night out in the countryside. And I will say some of those very garish kind of fire-like ba- coloring is still there. It looks like something in the background. It's next to a house. Could be a field. has the yellow, orange, and red. Very, But now – and there's just a few strips of blue and an odd shape of purple, but the colors outside of the the colors, the shapes now have gone completely to a bl- to almost a blur, you know. And now you're right, the trend. So you can tell it's the same artist, and you can even tell that he has the same color theory, but uh, their ability now to depict visually is is stunningly different. Right. So let, just to recap, like uh uh. He starts with this, and then five years later, he's on this. But then in one year, he's on to this. It's like a huge leap departure. In progress. It is a huge, it's a huge departure. So what's going on? What's going on? Okay, so what is going on, Randall? Well, we're gonna get to that. So here's another one he painted. This one he painted in 1910. You can see this is a huge difference. This, I mean, is, this is a black and white. Is it a watercolor? The original. Oh. The original of this one was lost. Uh. Probably destroyed by the Nazis. Um, so we only have a black and white photo, and yeah, oh, okay. I, I believe this was. So it was originally in color. I believe this was a a, a full on oil paint. Yeah. Okay, so in that case, it looks like shapes in movement, possibly running towards each other, possibly dancing, probably or standing. It's it it, it it's even less discernible. Right, we're really getting towards uh, abstraction here, and he's about to paint. This is the same year he paints his first abstract, which is okay. So this is 1910. This is, this is the same year, and you can see it's like a it's like a landscape, but uh, we're definitely moving towards something very landscape. Abstract. For those of you who are googling, it's landscape with factory chimney, oil on canvas. And I will say, if and you don't have to go back, but if you went, what year was those buildings that you just showed us? I think it was 1908. Well, right. And uh, so yeah, two years later, we are looking now at buildings 
that are even that are so beyond indiscernible that you you know it takes a moment for your eye to rest on on the shape of color to realize that the block of color is indicative of space you know it's almost like for five years, Kandinsky is groping towards like a non-figurative art, and then suddenly there's an explosion, and he's suddenly able to to move directly towards abstraction. He, you can see he's not even he's not there yet, but he's he's going to get there. And, because... and for those of you who think that it's an issue of vision, the lines in which he draws his shapes are very very tight. So it is clearly somebody with a very strong visual eye. Who understands shape and form, even if the textures are getting more and more ill-defined. Well, another yes, and another thing to observe is the colors aren't are getting less realistic. Okay, so, further and further out. Yes. Okay, so this is possibly the first abstract painting he makes ever made, <laughs> theoretically in 1910. Okay, so he's fine. For those there. of you who are just listening, this is just a series of abstract shapes in a white background with various uses of his favorite color blue which has been in every painting we've looked at as a dominant color some red some green some yellow but there is no the name of this painting is actually called uh untitled yeah this was just a watercolor he made in 1910 and he would go on in 1911 to make a more famous uh uh, acrylic or oil paint. Now, with, uh... my mom's a visual artist, and she's always told me that uh, watercolor is the most unforgiving medium. So you, you, either, you can see that all the choices he makes are deliberate, but you can't discern what it is he's trying to express. Okay, so so what happens? So it's it's almost like in 1908, he finally breaks through some kind of conceptual boundary. I mean, wouldn't you say? I mean, just looking at his Absolutely, work. Absolutely, yeah. Some, I... Something happened to, between the beginning of the 20th century and eight years in that causes him to go in a completely different direction. And I'm a bit confused, Randall. What what was the catalyst <laughs> for this change? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> this this is a picture of a woman. Her name is Hilma Off Clint. And she... Uh... And those for you who are listening, it is not to be confused with Gustav Klimt. Clint is K-L-I-N-T, to be very clear. For those listening, it might sound confusing. Yeah, Hilma off Clint, and she uh, uh, she's born in Sweden, and she actually um, she went to art school. She went to fine art school in Sweden. They had a one fine one fine art school like like Paris. All these countries have like the. And one. for those of you again who are just listening, I gotta say she's kind of cute. Yes, uh, I don't know. That might be off subject, but yes, she. I think she's a, a pretty. Woman. I mean, I know she would be like 150. She'd be <laughs> a good century older than me, but I think we could make it work. You know what? I don't think she ever gets married. Um, well, that's even better than she's waiting for me. <laughs> I'm here. Anyway, she. The year she goes to art school in Sweden, um, I believe, is the first year they allow women to go. And it's something to do with there was a war and they didn't have any men. And so there were like all these spots and they allowed women to go. Mm -hmm. And she became an accomplished uh, traditional artist in her own right. Um, she's born 1862. In 1875, this woman. Oh, so she's 103 years older than me. Yeah. <laughs> in 1875, this woman, Hel Helena Blavatsky, uh, co-founds with like three other people, something called the Theosophical Society. And for those of you who are listening, if you really want to Google her, so I'm going to spell her last name because it's pretty amazing. It's B-L-A-V-A-T-S-K-Y. Don't Google now. We want your fullest attention. But trust me, she's a fascinating woman, and Randall's about to tell us why. <laughs> well, the Theosophical Society was... Uh, described as uh, the synthesis of science, religion, and philosophy, proclaiming that it was reviving ancient wisdom which underlaid all the world's religions. So, in a way, the Theosophical Society, you know, it came, it came out of uh, uh, mediums and spiritualism, you know, seances, that sort of thing. This was big in the late 1800s in the Victorian era. 
and there's a lot of women involved in uh, in this area. A lot of the a lot of the people who become spiritual mediums, who are doing seances and communicating with the spirits, they are women. Um, and why do you think that is? You know, this is a this is a question that I have not found an answer to. Okay, I believe I believe it could be. Um, this whole field is sort of an outsider field. It's like uh, if you're in the mainstream society, right? You're not going to become a medium. This is this is a completely open field with no real status hierarchy, with no real rules, and so it's only outsiders that are attracted. So you're going to have uh, women who are accomplished and smart, and you know maybe they come from good families. And there are other doors closed to them in society. Very so good point. they decide to become point. mediums. <laughs> no, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a great deal of sense. And also, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And even though Blavatsky co-founded the society with like three other people, she was a, she was a, a major force in the society. Um, I remember we were, you and I were meeting with another friend of um, ours, who's a Blavatsky expert. Uh, do you remember anything he added about Blavatsky? Well, he verified a lot of things that um, I had found in my research. So I'll get to that, Chris. Okay. So, uh, okay. So this is a Hilma off Clint. Clint. This is uh, one it's a of rather the... pastoral scene. Uh, we're out in a field uh, in the center. No, actually more like, yeah, the center right corner is a man or what looks like the back of a man to be more precise standing in a field sometime in the late afternoon, I would say, given the quality of the sky, it's, it's an unspectacular painting. Well, I want to show this because this is the kind of uh, painting that people were making at the time, okay? So Europe had uh, a well-developed uh, fine art industry. Uh, people went to art school and then they painted these paintings and they sold them. And this is the kind of thing that uh, Hilma off Clint would have painted for money. This is how she made her money. Okay, so five years after uh, Blavatsky founds the Theosophical Society, which is interested in, in, in these societies, you know, Theosophical Society is one of the bigger ones. These societies are really interested in the occult and anything that that's unexplained that um, that our modern science, our modern uh, world does not explain. They they, they want they they're exploring all that. So anything to do with spirits and the afterlife and the occult. Um, so in 1880, Hilma's ten year old sister dies, and she's still a kid, but she, um, well, she's in her like she's 18, I think, and she she becomes interested in the occult. She wants to communicate with her sister in the afterlife. Um, and then she goes to fine art school. She starts painting paintings like this. She she is an exceptional artist, apparently. Okay, she graduates with honors, and she's awarded the use of uh, a shared studio until 1909. Apparently, because of her uh, because of the accolades she gained while, when she graduated. While she's there painting, she's exploring the occult, and she's she's making these paintings for money, and then she founds uh, <clears throat> a society with uh with four other women hmm. and we know a lot about her by the way because she left like um hundreds of pages of diary <laughs> so we know a lot about her um but she founds this occult society with with four other women and they do seances like every week and they try to you know they're trying to communicate with the dead and whatever um and i want to just add that in this period there's all sorts of weird stuff happening with technology right so you have uh X-rays being discovered in 1895, radio waves discovered, and the first radios in 1900, radioactivity is discovered in 1896. Um, and so Hilma is experimenting with uh, something called automatic drawing at these seances, which a lot of these people do. Um, okay, so this is a... this is So, a, so she and Lebovatsky are actually now, at this point in the story... Well, Blavatsky... <clears throat> I don't think she knows Blavatsky that well. I don't, I don't even know if they ever met. Okay. But, but if you want to understand some of the things that um, Hilma was interested in, you should look up Blavatsky. Because okay. Hilma was basically interested in all the same stuff, okay? 
Um, like like automatic drawing, for instance. So automatic drawing. Okay, so what we're looking at now is is this automatic drawing here? It is. So a, this is a. Yes, yeah, so this is an early hill background mm -hmm. with uh, a series of circles, mostly uh, green, and then in the lower center, uh, almost like a yellow circle. It, it looks almost like patterns. It's funny when you were saying about radio waves. It almost really reminds me of the diagram you see when you see the diagram for sound, but it's okay. circular. Yeah, so I think that this is a good example of automatic drawing. So imagine you're doing a seance and supposedly you've meditated your mind into another plane. <laughs> and so you're gonna, now you're going to let the spirits uh, guide your hands and draw something on a piece of paper. And you're, this is what you get. And then later on, she takes the scribbles and maybe she adds some colors to it. So she just kind of went like around and around and around. You can almost kind of figure, look, you can almost see, I was trying to look up automatic drawing, but I could. But I, if, I'm, if I, it looks to me like she went to the upper left-hand corner of the painting and she just started drawing circles, from, working her way all the way to the bottom. Or she started from the bottom and she worked all her way to the top. And she did it looks like four times. Or actually, if you look at the brush stroke, I'm trying to call up the painting on my phone so I can get a better view of it. But folks, if you see, it even looks like the brush strokes are going up from the center, like she's just painting out and out. Anyway, it's, just, it's like almost trance-like. Right, well, she was in a trance when she did most of the work on this. Um, now, this was painted by her probably in 1906 or seven. Wait, and so this is before Kandinsky? This is before Kandinsky. So Kandinsky makes whoa, whoa, his first... Whoa, whoa, whoa. We just saw... <laughs> I'm sorry, but didn't we just so Like, Kandinsky, it's 1908. 1910 is 1910. when Kandinsky so in 19... supposedly... Yeah, 1908, he's still doing, like, representational buildings and homes yes. and people. And in... Okay, I... There's a little... What's going on, Randall? And... I want to add something else. Kandinsky is also part of the Theosophical Society. Kandinsky is also into these seances and stuff. So there's no evidence that they met, but there's evidence that perhaps Kandinsky was influenced by her work, which we'll get to. So, Okay, so, this so, is a little bit – okay, I'm, well, you've got my attention. Okay, so so Clint – Paints is and starts making paintings like this, you know, on the side, you know, aside from now. Now, now I want to add too, you know, Clint is not an outsider. She's not an amateur. She is a professional artist. Primordial chaos. Like... Just to let you guys know, if you want to look up the painting, it's called Primordial Chaos. Go ahead. Clint is not an amateur. She is. She is. She's gone to art school. She's painting. She's selling paintings on the art market, just like Kandinsky at the time. Okay. Yeah. Um. Okay. So. So here's another one. This is from 1906 again. This <laughs> Whoa, 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 whoa. So this one here, which is called, oh, great, Primordial Chaos Number 1, Group 1, 1906. I can't even really describe it well as more of a series of black lines on a white background with some sort of figurative, almost like a ghost or S-like shape in white with blue highlights it it's completely indiscernible though you, you would agree this is absolutely an abstract painting wouldn't you correct? absolutely it's yeah absolutely it's deliberative in construction and composition but uh, good luck trying to dif dif discern what it's about <laughs> so what is this from 1912 no it's 1906 wait no okay right. so because this, is four, real, this years. is four years four years before kandinsky supposedly <sighs> paints the first abstract painting Wow, that's amazing. And Clint is a contemporary. She's in Europe. She has gone to art school. She's on the art market selling traditional paintings, and she's also painting these paintings, okay? Okay. Um, I mean, is there a pretty good shot? Okay, keep on going. This is just another one. This is another one from 1906. Um, let's go this on. This one's called, yeah, it's called Chaos. Again, it's, it's just colors and shapes, and that's the best way to describe it. Very there's abstract. some there's some there's a uh, star in the in the side. Yeah, it looks like it's there's actually two stars. Right. There's 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 two five pointed star symbols, but uh, you know, they're symbols, yeah. they're not a figurative in any way. Right. There could be a musical note. I cannot tell what it is. But this is absolutely an abstract painting, wouldn't you say? One hundred percent. Okay. Okay, so now 
Okay, hold on. Before we get to the next slide. <laughs> so Hilma's doing these seances. She's doing automatic drawing. She, the spirits are telling her stuff. At some point, she starts communicating with what she thinks are spirits called the high masters. And the high masters are, are you know, some kind of spiritual entities living on another plane of existence. And they tell her she needs to create paintings for the temple. And she d doesn't know what the temple is, but she says the spirits are telling her to create paintings for the temple. So here's a quote from her. The pictures were painted directly through me without any preliminary drawings and with great force. I had no idea what the paintings were supposed to depict. None, nevertheless, I worked swiftly and surely without changing a single brush stroke. Wow. Okay, now, so... uh. This is in 1904 where she is told that um, the temple should be built and filled with paintings. Um, let's see. She had a spiritual gu guide called Emma Leal, she says, who contacted her during seances. And she says uh, Emma Leal helped commission the paintings <laughs> and helped direct her hand somewhat. Um Let's see. Okay, so now, with the help... Now, I want to add, too, this group that Hilma puts together, there's four other women in it, and I'm trying to remember all the background, but I believe most of the other women in the group are also fine artists. Wow. I mean, and they help her. I think they help her, but uh, at least Hilma, anyway, she claims she's the guiding force. I mean, I believe it. She's the guiding force. You know, she's the you leader. Know, it's interesting. She's not the first artist who... I've heard of in in any of the fields who've claimed possession either by a ghost, a spirit, a higher being, or an alien. Uh, for those of you who are thinking this is crazy, there was a science fiction writer named Philip K. Dick, who wrote you know Blade Runner and Total Recall, and he claimed uh, at the, around the end of his life for about three years he was just had been contacted by an alien life force <laughs> that was speaking through him and his work. Well, uh, yes. So it isn't like people are going, she must have been nuts. It's like, well, I don't know. There's definitely a long history of artists who have claimed that their muse was more like a radio wave between <laughs> themselves. Right. I was about to say, else. it's just it's just like the ancient Greeks who claimed they had muses. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, don't be so quick to discount her, folks, is all I'm saying. She was not a nut. Well, I wouldn't discount it all because, you know, because when I, when, okay, when I did the research for these shows, Chris, I looked at the paintings themselves. I mean, you're looking at this painting right now. That's absolutely an abstract painting. Okay, so regardless of how she arrived at it, okay, it's it's absolutely an abstract painting. I mean, I discounted a couple of Picabia's works, one of them at least, because he didn't intend to create an abstract painting, but she is absolutely intending to create abstract paintings at this time. Right. And I'm about to go on to show... So, so these spirits, they asked her to create these paintings for the temple, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? These spirits are telling her to create these amazing paintings for the temple. Her and her group of four other women, uh, they finished uh, 10 enormous paintings in 1907. That's three years at least before um, Kandinsky paints his first abstract. So here's, here's a picture of the paintings hanging in the Guggenheim for their show. And you can see how, I want you to see it because you see how large they are. You see? Oh my God. They're, they're like what? They're like 20 feet? Well, if, at least. I don't know. Maybe, maybe 10 at least. But yeah, I mean, they're, they're pretty big. Um, now let's go on because, because, uh, let's look at some of these because, you know, the, the, the detail in these is amazing. Okay. So here's another picture of them. Okay. And it's interesting, too, because, I mean, if, if you didn't know any better, you would have thought these were post-war abstractionist <laughs> works. You would think these are contemporary, Chris. Because yeah, I mean, these things look at the oldest. No, no, they look like at the oldest they could be from the 40s or they could be from just, you know, in the last 10 years. Because, so. you know, regardless of uh, what you think she was trying to do, I mean, she accomplished – creating the abstract art 
she created she 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 created the the abstract art concepts you're gonna see for the, like the next like 50 years basically. So this man here is uh, Rudolf Steiner. I know okay. good old Rudolf. Yeah. Yeah. So Rudolf Steiner was another guy in the Theosophical <laughs> and the educator too. Right. So he was. Uh, do you want to talk about him a little bit? Well, Steiner had some very interesting beliefs about how to raise children and teach children. Uh, Steiner schools do exist. Maybe one of you guys have gone to a Steiner school. I believe it was, are they called the Montessori? I can never remember the name. Sorry, do you remember the name of his schools? I'll look it up. Okay, so he had this belief that with children, they need to have their imaginations and creativity. So he did not want dolls to be perfect replica of faces, so he wouldn't like your your action figures. Waldorf he, schools, right? The Waldorf school, thank you. And he wanted uh, the faces to be somewhat incomplete so that the child's imagination, and that's how he felt about a lot of visual representations and play toys, is that there needed to be space. Things shouldn't be so realistic. There needs to be little spaces of gaps that could be filled by imagination. There's a lot more I could say about Waldorf education, but I just want to keep it relative, relevant to this particular discussion. Well, Steiner is another big, he's, he's like a celebrity in theosophy and in, in, in the world of uh, seances and mediums and spiritualism and alternative. It's basically like an alternative um, metaphysics, I would almost. Um, That's an excellent description. And, you know, the mainstream metaphysics would be uh, Christianity. Uh, so he is, he's a big celebrity and Clint is really working with her group of other female artists uh, in secret, in private, like in obscurity. And after she completes these paintings, the 10 largest they're called, um, she is excited and she, she begs this guy Steiner to come look at them. Mm -hmm. And uh, by this time she had painted 111 paintings in this vein and Steiner comes and sees them, and I'll tell you what happens after we look at some of them. Okay, so these are the ten largest. Let's go through them. So this is, this is number one. This is okay. This uh, is called childhood. 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 Yeah, and you can see it's like there is. I mean, the fascinating thing about this one is, um, you can He's see got circles and shapes. Are it flowers? You were saying. Go on. Right. It looks like there's there. These things look like flowers. Okay? Yeah. They're not exactly flowers. They look like flowers. And then you have what looks like writing, but it's not, it just looks like writing. It's not actually writing. Right. I mean, it's like, it's like, and you'll see other abstract painters come to these conceptual ideas much later on, like decades later. You know, she is making, she's making objects in her paintings that, that look like objects, but not really the object. I mean, it's, 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 it's aesthetically fascinating, you know, and, and, and this, <laughs> This is possibly the first one she makes. Um, you can see just how beautiful it is, you know, the detail. Okay, let's go to the next it's, one. It's very, these are interesting because there's a lot of spheres, circles, ovals, flowers, and things. But clearly all of her lines are very tight and concentric. So everything she's doing, there's no sense of randomness. Everything looks deliberately uh, composed. Yeah, and if you notice, if you go back to like Kandinsky's early abstracts, uh, they seem much more messy, you know, they, they seem yeah. less deliberate. I mean, these yeah, are this, incredibly this, this, deliberate. Just to get the proportionality, to keep things from falling on top of each other, you know, someone would go, oh, that's just a Venn diagram. Like, oh no, that really requires a good, a very strong sense of composition to figure out the balance of shape, color, Unlike what you showed earlier, which was maybe just drawing circles by spiritual possession, this one definitely looks like a very deliberate piece. Yeah, that's right. Um, okay, yeah, so interesting you should say Venn diagram, because, yeah, I guess I guess uh, it says here the Venn diagram started to become popular in the 1880s, so she, she obviously knew what a Venn diagram was. Um, I mean, she probably had seen one. Um, and it's kind of clever because she takes orange and blue, and makes green, which is technically how you make green. So it's almost like it's very cheeky. Well, she's playing with colors, right? She's exploring colors and how they influence uh, influence the audience. 
um, which is what all the abstract painters will do. But it, even even conceptually, and I'm sorry, now I'm being like a, a docent at an art museum. Yeah, go but, ahead. Eh, it's called childhood, and you could argue that the orange is the mother and the blue is the father, <laughs> and the green, which falls between the two, which is how you make green, is their offspring. And then they are these like beautiful pastels of pink and, and, and sky blue and yellow, which are very much childlike colors. Uh, and there's this weird kind of almost weird greenish white thing on the upper left hand. So there is a feeling of childhood there. She, she definitely understands symbolic uh, and uh, it, she understands how to get a symbolic feeling from indicative shapes and colors without being explicit. And it's a, it's a very smart, it's a very smart painting is what I I'm mean, to say. All these paintings are amazing. All are paintings. And, it's a and, lot of thought going into this abstract work. Right. And I want you to. Which and, is something and, they normally don't. Later on in the 40s and 50s, when we get into, you know, what we considered American abstractionism, there's a lot of questions about, is there any thought? <laughs> that is going into abstractionism. So well, Pollock clearly is, not, this is not this is not Pollock. He's not taking a basketball and just smacking canvas with paint. Yeah, Pollock, I think even by his own admission, is fairly thoughtless. Yeah. Um, okay. So, but 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 you see how much you're getting out of this. Yeah. Way more than Kandinsky's early works, right? Oh, absolutely. Okay. This really feels like it should come 10, 15 years after Kandinsky. And this is three years before Kandinsky. Okay, I'm really three. wanna. I know you're holding out on something, so <laughs> you, you gotta let us know. I'm get you're you're, you're tantalizing. Me. Well, I mean, okay. So this is number three. So this is called Youth, and you can see the orange makes it just. It, it adds so much energy. You're like, uh, it it makes it more vibrant. You know, you're. It screams youth, doesn't it? I yeah, mean, it has egg like shapes, ovals. It to me almost has a 1950s, 60s kind of of color tones and shapes. It really looks much more like the kind of abstractionist work that's coming out around the end of the 50s, right through the middle of the 60s. Okay, here, this one's youth again. You see she's using the same popsicles. orange. She's got popsicles. <laughs> I, I mean, that's my guess. I think those are popsicles. But I don't know. It could be a kaleidoscope. I mean, it, uh, yes, this is great stuff. All right, this is adulthood, 1907. So you see, she's using a script again that's not really more a muted colors, lavender black, a, a deeper blue, a gold, much more refined, much more composed. A it's floral really, it's, point. At the it's very really, top. it's really impressive, isn't it, Chris? Yeah, no, it's, it's great. I mean, for 1907, yeah. and I, and I want to add, she is not um, bouncing off of other artists. <laughs> She's making this all her own with her with her with her four minions. Okay, yeah, that is amazing. <laughs> all right, and this is called. Oh, let's see, this is. Uh, I don't know what this is. This is number six. There is some uh, typeface in this one. There is some lettering. It almost looks like a greeting card, and I don't mean that as a put down. Yeah, it almost looks like it could be a poster, and yeah. with the writing, and I, and you know, you know who. You know who later on uses a lot of script in their work is um, what's his name Basquiat. Oh yeah, you're uh, right. She's she's like she's like predicting Basquiat almost in this. And uh, yeah. And and this one too, you can see she's got these Roman numerals here, labeling yep. something that's indecipherable. I mean, it's, and it's something next to it on the left looks like it could be a clock. There's a letter H. There's these weird floral and onion-like shapes and pearl shapes. These are all adulthood, I, I think. They're still adulthood, so yeah. they all have the same color. Adulthood all has the same color. Okay, so this is one, two, three. The three stages of life. That makes sense. Well, this is another one. This is another one. Adulthood. Um, if it does, it feel older than the other ones? Yes, because of the <laughs> somehow the, this the is colors older. are getting darker. Well, no, as, as time goes by, the colors become more muted. The pastels aren't quite so bright now. But the connectivity, again, you have white, yellow, and blue. These She's still trying to show you how everything relates with everything else. It's really quite What a amazing. series, right? I mean, if you had gone into an art gallery and you saw this, you'd be blown away, I bet. I mean, even today. Yeah. Well, I if I looked at this in an art gallery, I would really want to look at all the drafts that she did to get <laughs> to this place because it's, again... If you look at it for more than a minute, you realize 
if she had moved one thing just a little bit in the wrong direction, everything would have fallen apart. She's filled up so much space that what keeps it from being cluttered is a lot of very deliberate decisions about shape and color. You know, if I try to make the same painting or you did, we would quickly realize that we don't know everything would fall on top of each other. You know, there's also there's so many interesting touches in her paintings too. Like on this one, you can see you see this little little black swiggle up. Yeah. The, I mean, that's the only one that's so black. There's a little black right here too, but it's it's just. Yeah. I don't know. She makes these fascinating decisions. Uh, I mean, this is miles away from Kandinsky and other artists that have come out. Well, it it it, it speaks to just her use of, of line and color and shape. It it feels to me like someone who was spent many years working in abstractionism having made a lot of mistakes and figured out how to make it clean and elegant. It doesn't look like the beginning of a style. It really looks more like the refinement of a well, style. Well, she did paint like 100 abstract paintings, more than 100, and these 10 are possibly, she intended to be her masterpiece. Um, okay, so this is number nine. We're almost at the end. So this is, uh, I'm not sure what this is called. This could be old age i don't know but um well it does again you have the floral motif that continues now as a pinwheel pattern uh with a, a rusty or almost a, a very bloody red like a rust like dried red at the bottom that then saturates out to white at the top in three again there's three or four stages depending on how you want to look at her choices you can even see kind of blocks you can see the squares too that compose it she does border things with a certain symmetry of left and right shapes being equal except the positions at the bottom and the color choice at the bottom and the color choice at the top is completely different and i keep on wanting to think that this is the difference between male and female but i'll be honest with you i'm just imposing my own duality <laughs> It, 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 and as most you, you know, you might be right, Chris. She course. she did she did do a number of paintings uh, regarding um, the difference between men and women. Okay, she, she was fascinated by gender. I think if you look at her paintings. Okay, so this is the last one. Now look, at, isn't it interesting? So this one, uh, she's going going to squares. Yeah, and again, it's a is it one square? If you look back, it looks like one square with four distinct sides and a T or Christ shape through it, or it's four separate squares that just hang out in space, bordered by, again, these two floral-like things right to the side of them that are in reverse pattern, color-wise. One has blue petals, one has yellow petals, one is blue, one is yellow, but then you have two different shades of red. Uh, you know, just to go back to, if you can see our background here, one of the color values was changed. It's a very subtle thing you can't notice in our logo, uh, but it can happen sometimes that uh, you rarely see two colors of the same. I mean, those two reds are not exactly identical, but they're damn near close. Yeah, very interesting choices. Um, yeah. Okay, so in 1908, I already told you, so... so uh, Clint was, um, she had completed these paintings with her group and she wanted, and she didn't know Rudolf Steiner, but he was like a superstar. You know, he went around the country talking and founding schools and around the world. And he was a star in the Theosophical, I'm not saying it right. The Theosoph Theosophical Society. Right. So she writes to him and she's like, yeah, um, the spirits told me to make these uh, paintings. Come see them. They're amazing. And... <laughs> Which to him would make sense, by the way, because this is the world he's in too, so. So he came and saw the paintings, but he didn't like them. And he said her way of working was inappropriate for a theosophist for some reason. Um, well, he had very distinct aesthetic rules, as I just said. He, he had a very strict belief of where create what creativity should and should not show. Well... Blavatsky and Steiner, perhaps, they both kind of didn't look, they looked down on uh, me, being mediums. They looked down on the mediums a little bit. I mean, mediums are kind of starting to get a bad name, you know, because there's a lot of, like, chicanery. Uh, but 
But the thing I think is going on with um, Hilma and her group is they are accessing their subconscious mind when they are doing these seances. You know, which is important because this is, um, you know, this is a time when people's true motivations and desires are highly suppressed. I mean, this is this is the world Freud comes out of, right? And mm -hmm. and Freud comes up with the idea of the subconscious because uh, people in civilization at this time are 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 in denial about many things, right? Um, So Steiner, Steiner doesn't like the paintings. Clint is surprised. Clint is devastated, right? She's a very sensitive person. Uh, she's a sensitive artist, right? And apparently she stops painting for four years after, in, 19, after, in 1908 because, because of what uh, Steiner said. That's terrible. Some other, I've read some other research that it may be that in some of uh and you saw you saw it in this one in some of uh Clint's works like you see you see I think you were right to say this is male and female in a lot of Clint's works male and Oh female. I just even realized the 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 petal pattern isn't just different colors even the shapes are different because mm -hmm. the right petal is three very large dominant petals whereas the left I think is four or five it's actually or six. It's very hard to tell. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Go on. So, a lot of her works, she puts men and women on an equal level, <laughs> like two sides of the same coin. That and makes sense. There's some... are, these shapes are of equal size too. Yes, you see how equal. If if these represent male and female, in this painting, you see how equal they are. Right? They're different yeah. but equal. Yeah. You see? And some of the research and there's other paintings that are even more explicit as regards this uh this yeah. thinking that she's made um which Steiner would have seen. And so some of the research I've read says that uh Steiner he was disgusted by that <laughs> because he really thought that women were the inferior of men and she's making these paintings where men and women are equals and yeah. Steiner didn't like that. That's one thing that apparently Steiner didn't like. Um, I mean, I'm not sure. Some of the research I, I've done says that, but I'm not exactly certain. I would have sure there are some female supporters of Steiner who would say that that is a debatable point. Right. I don't know how true that is, but, uh, okay. So, okay. But here's, has it. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the most important thing. Okay. Um, 1908, same year that she meets Steiner, she gives Steiner some photographs of her work. And she even hands, she must have taken black and white photos of her work and then hand colored them. Okay, oh, wow. so, that, so that Steiner would have a, co a nice copy of them. Yeah. There's evidence that Steiner, who's a theosophist, meets up with Kandinsky, another theosophist and shows Kandinsky the photographs. Oh, wow. Okay, so you can imagine these paintings we just looked at. She showed, Steiner showed photographs of these paintings to Kandinsky. And then the next year, Kandinsky gets on the road to abstraction. Hmm. And there you so go. Are you thinking this is not a coincidence? Of course, no, I don't think it is a coincidence. And in fact, okay. I think I think you know this is a small world. You know, they're they're moving in the same artistic circles. I mean, that's just one connection that historians have found between Kandinsky and Clint. Mm -hmm. But there may be others. I mean, Kandinsky, they're in the same Theosophical Society. Kandinsky may have seen other works of hers. I mean, it's 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 entirely possible. Um. Let's see. So, so she stops painting for four years because she's so disappointed. <laughs> and in 1923, she writes another letter to Steiner asking him what she should do with the paintings because she's she is like, let's see. So in her life, she ends up painting like um, 
about maybe 1,200 abstract paintings. Wow. I mean, this is this woman is unbelievable, right? And, you know, these paintings are just just hanging out in her basement, I think. Yeah. And she writes Steiner, and she's painting these paintings for the Theosophical Society. She's painting them for for Steiner's group, for for you know this 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 group of people and Steiner doesn't like him yeah and she doesn't know what to do with them so in 1923 she she writes him a letter and she asks if she should burn them mm. <laughs> that's, that's how funny. hurt she is okay and Steiner is a big star you know and she he never writes back cuz he's done with her right and then a couple of years later Steiner dies oh wow in 1928 mm. theosophy reaches peak membership Mm -hmm. um and then the nazis come to power so in the 1930s the not you know you have the rise of the nazis the nazis hate modern art obviously they're gonna hate anything she makes and and hitler know? had as having been an art student himself has also a very defined uh, aesthetic criterion yeah so hitler we're gonna go into hitler's taste in art next episode but um yeah so this is obviously this abstract art is not part of Hitler's wheelhouse, okay? <laughs> and in fact, Hitler hates the modern world, and 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 they destroy. There's this. Um, we already went through the uh, the Bauhaus school in Berlin, and the Bauhaus school is, uh, you know, they help to define the modern world in an aesthetic way. And the Nazis hate the Bauhaus school. They 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 force the Bauhaus school to close. Um. In 1932, like the year before Hitler comes to power, I mean, I think that Clint sees the writing on the wall. So she writes out her last will. And in the will, she leaves 1,200 paintings, 26,000 pages of notes. Um, and she says in her will that none of these notes or paintings are supposed to be shown until 20 years after her death. Oh wow! And I, and I think that's because she doesn't want her descendants to get in trouble with the Nazis. Okay, makes sense. So at least next... not in trouble with the Nazis until twenty years after her death. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. Is like I love how you know. 20... It's almost sometimes I feel like she could have had a time machine. She traveled into like the nineteen fifties. She saw the kind of work abstractionist was doing. She figured out how long World War II would last. She looked up her own date of death. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not you know, saying that really happened. I'm just saying if you were ever going to write a speculative science fiction story, it would work. She, you know, she is almost a time traveler, Chris. I mean, she, that's what I'm just keep on wanting. I mean, it's obviously, you know, I know she isn't, but I, yeah, I, but she it's could true. be. It's true. She, she's a very, I mean, just reading about her, she's a very intelligent woman. You could tell. Yeah. Enormously talented. Um, she, she can foresee the future. She knows. This, she writes her last will a year before the Nazis come in power, trying to protect her descendants against the Nazis, protect her work against the Nazis. Or is it possible? Yes. Hear me out. <laughs> that the being, the being that spoke to her from an elevated plane, <laughs> and see the entire, he doesn't live in the same dimension we do. So clearly for them, maybe time isn't a linear thing. Maybe all time happens at once. They come from a world of quantum, you know, where the laws of quantum mechanics are different. So that higher being knows all that will happen has occurred and says, look, you're going to die here. The Nazis are going to take over here. And then your art can go back and you're then, you know what I'm saying? I'm not, who knows? Entirely might have gotten possible, the tip off. but it's, I do yeah. think maybe she was just a genius, but, uh, a mad genius, who a knows? mad genius, but no, I don't think she was mad at all. Actually. Um, so she wasn't uh, mad about the way she was treated? Oh, well, an angry genius. Okay, maybe. <laughs> to the rescue. I wouldn't say she was crazy, though. No, um, I didn't say she was crazy. Just she see, not I mean, happy she with see, the Nazis. You know, you can see in her painting, she's so deliberate. I mean, she's she, everything is thought out. Every I'm line. just saying that I mean, she is a woman with something who clearly has a point of view, and that is good. Oh, yeah. Well, in um, okay, so Hitler becomes Chancellor of Germany. And, you know, another another far reaching aspect of of uh, another thing she really predicts is she knows the Nazis aren't going to last. Right. I mean, this is how this is how smart she is. She said 20 years, they'll be gone. <laughs> Either that or that alien was like that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you're going to die this day. 
Put your work for 20 years and, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, take whatever money you have and put it into IBM. Apple stock. <laughs> that would have been the cool thing. Yeah, well, buy, you know, she, was born, she was born wealthy. She was born in a wealthy family. Um, so she never had to worry about money. Um, in 1944, she dies of oh a car. Oh, my God. Are you telling me someone from a wealthy a wealthy family decided to pursue a career in the art? <laughs> That's amazing. Sorry. I'm Unbelievable. Uh, in 1944, she died of a car accident. She was 82 years old. And the same year, Kandinsky dies of 77. Mondrian dies of 71. What? Coincidence? Or yeah, are I... these time travelers just taking out all the great <laughs> abstractions? No, I'm sorry. Go on. Uh, Mondrian. I love Mondrian. Why didn't we talk about Mondrian? We have to do a whole other show on Petit Well, Mondrian. we did talk about him last episode. But okay. So in the. Oh, 19... you're right. Go watch the last episode. In the 1970s, uh, her, her descendant who had all her works. Johan off Clint, he offered all her works to the uh, the Swedish Modern Museum, Moderna Musit, I think it's called. And I've been there actually. It is got one of the greatest collections of American abstractionist art and all abstractionist art. I went there in 1987, and I did look probably at her work and other people's work because that's what they're known for. They are the premier museum for for abstractionist art anywhere in the world okay so get this in the 1970s uh her relative her her descendant offers all her works to the museum and they're like yeah. no we're not gonna look at them oh damn it we don't want them they heard they said oh we heard she was a medium and we don't like uh crappy medium art so <laughs> but i guess i didn't see her work but she's gonna get redeemed because in 2013, they do a show. They do a retrospective for her. But before that happens, she has to get discovered. How does she get discovered? Well, it's a long story. But in 1985, uh, let me see if I can remember this story right. Um, she has a descendant in 1985 who I believe is a art professor. Mm -hmm. And he has like some kind of like nervous breakdown, you know. And he goes home to the family mansion or whatever it is. I think they have a castle or something. And and uh, I believe he discovers some of her paintings in the basement. And he's like, what the? He didn't even know. And then he finds out that some of her paintings are still hanging on the walls of uh, the local Theosophical Society. Oh, wow. So he walks in and he sees them hanging there. And uh, he's like, are these like my uh, great grandmother's uh, <laughs> paintings? And they're like, I don't know. I don't know what these are. Nobody even knows what they are, Chris. Wow. And so he collects them all up and he uh, he makes her known to the world. And in 1986, I think is her first real show. 2013 is the Stockholm show, which is some people say it's their most popular in the history of the museum. In 2019, she has a Guggenheim show, which they say may have been the most popular Guggenheim show of all time. Well, she's she's gone from being an, uh, an early 20th century artist to being a 21st century phenomenon. I know. And then in 2020, yeah, she makes uh, there's a documentary called Beyond the Visible, Hilma off Clint. So you can yeah. watch that. OK, so. So now, do you have any questions about Clint? I mean, it's a fascinating story, isn't it? I mean, do you th have I convinced you that um, well that Clint uh, influenced Kandinsky? Kandinsky the, really painted abstract art because of he saw her work. There's that old saying that genius is never discovered in its own time, and I think you made a very compelling argument in this episode. <laughs> All right, but there's more, Chris. Okay. There's an addendum to the addendum. Are you ready? I am ready. Okay. This is Georgina Houghton. Georgina Houghton lives like a hundred years before uh, before Clint, before uh, uh, before Kandinsky. So she's early nineteenth century. Yes, mid eighteen hundred. So she starts making. Um, now I, I want you to also keep in mind that uh, the Salon des Refuses, which is the first alternative art uh, show gallery display it happens in 1863 so right. she oh. so she has no access to impressionism any kind of alternative art in europe 
she starts making spirit drawings. She's a medium, and she starts making these spirit drawings at seances in 1859. So she's another medium. And before even the Salon de Refuses, she's making automatic art. She's she's doing spirit drawings. It's very similar to what Hilma's doing, right? Like like uh, like 50 years later, okay? Um, so she makes all these paintings. She makes like, I don't know, hundreds, maybe dozens, maybe hundreds of paintings. And in 1871, and she's yeah. a total outsider, okay? She doesn't have, she has no training. She mm -hmm. doesn't, she's not a conventional painter. She's, I think, just like an upper class, eccentric British lady. Right. In 1871, she makes a show. She she puts together an art show in London to show off her works and try to sell them. So here's one of her works. So this, this is like from 1871 or earlier. Do you think this is abstract, Chris? It reminds me of Georgia O'Keeffe. Here, let's look at us some more. Look at this one. There's a lot of interesting lines and patterns that could be interpreted as hair. <laughs> Doesn't have to be interpreted as hair. Uh, but looks to me more like something you would have seen in the 50s from mm -hmm. any of the other um, or late 40s, early 60s. But it, it definitely looks to me like American abstraction, abstract art post-war with... With it, yeah, absolutely. She's fifty-seven years old. Uh, she had. Oh, I can be your girl next year. She's she's fifty-seven years old. She she had one hundred fifty-five paintings at this show. I'm gonna show you a few of these. Here's another one. Wow, that's I mean, it's nice. beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, it's quite lovely um, and quite abstract. <laughs> yes. Uh, here's another one. Wow, Amazing, more isn't more it? line work, more line work, more color, more shape. You can see how some of these come out of automatic drawing, probably. Yeah, probably. Um, let's see. Galleries wouldn't show her works, so she had to do this show. And she sold one. I think I already said that. She sold one. Hmm. <laughs> I always wondered who bought that one. Her mom. <laughs> probably. I'm joking. <laughs> Look at this one. It cut, this looks like it could more be a lines, face, right? More lines, yeah, more in the shape of a face. I mean, that's this is unbelievable. This is like almost like a spider web pattern. I mean, how many years before Kandinsky? This is um, let's see. What what are we looking at here? It's uh, nine. I can't see the years. This is uh, thirty nine years before Kandinsky. Wow, math right. wow, that's amazing. <laughs> Here's another one. Mm-hmm. Some of the critics said, uh, if I were to sum up the characteristics of the exhibition, a single phrase, we would pronounce it symbolism gone mad. Um, <laughs> so this is what, the 1860s? It's 1871. Uh, yeah, so just for those of you who have been following us, remember we were dealing with Impressionism and post-Impressionism. So the art of this particular time is the sixth, is seven, did you say uh, 1870s? It's 1871 that the show, ha her show happened. So, I mean, if you look at what was being done by really great artists at this time, it was still based in interpretations of nature, people, buildings. There was a certain degree of, I mean, photorealism was definitely on the way out, but still you were, you were dealing with much more concrete uh, shapes. Well, the, the, at best these look like peacock feathers. Yeah, and uh, in 1871, the Salon de Refuse was only eight years old, so it was still going strong. I mean, the, I don't even think the term Impressionism was coined yet. Um, no, this is before Impressionism, much less post-Impressionism. That's what I'm trying to say. This is, you're, you're really dealing now with, you know, what is mostly naturalism is still the pre prevalent aesthetic in most good homes uh, at this period in history. This is pretty far out is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. This, this, I mean, look at this. This is amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, and again, I don't know whether you can really interpret the, the figures to mean anything or nothing, but they're so in this, yeah. Uh, definitely abstract, right? Quite. And creepy at the same time. Okay, I do see at least the shape of an eyelid on the extreme 
upper right hand corner. Uh, well, it's interesting because she or maybe use... not. Again, you know, this is the problem with the human brain, right? We try to impose patterns and symbols where there is nothing. So, yeah, it's beautiful work as far as shape, color, texture. But yeah, it's impossible to know what it is she's trying to capture. Okay, so this is the last... that's a face. Thank you. Yeah, this is the last one I want to show of her. So. So, it is a human face, yay! In in an otherwise insane, and maybe I could see why people thought she was symbolist, because at least there's some recognizable iconography in this particular work to to play with. It's called the portrait of the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, it's okay. Christ looks like a little girl with a flower in her head. Yeah, I mean, you got Christ, and you got um, the maybe the spiritual plane that Christ actually lives in all around yeah. him. I don't know, <laughs> but this is definitely, there's, there's abstract, there's abstraction in this painting and she's mixing it with some figurative art, which, which is, uh, you know, this is miles ahead of, of this is, I mean, she's 40 years ahead of her time. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, so now Chris, am I blowing your mind? Because now, I mean, traditionally we think Kandinsky invented abstract art in right. 1910. Right, but it's possible he was influenced by a woman who was a spiritualist, but also a, a fellow fine artist. Mm -hmm. Okay, who Hilma off Clint, but then even before these two came around, you had another spiritualist, another medium, painting. Uh, what looks there's like no way that dark. that either Clint or. Kandinsky would have had access to her work. You know, I don't know, Chris. I, 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 I think it's a possibility, but I don't know. I, I, I've been, I've been, I've been looking, I've been looking, and I, I can't find anything. Oh. But it's possible. Um. So what is so so what does this mean? I mean, I, th I think I think you definitely can see, with what I've just presented to you, that abstract art doesn't come out of the Western tradition. I mean, and, and I think in our first episode on this subject, uh, we saw that abstract art doesn't come out of almost any cultural tradition. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's Every culture has problems making abstract art. But it seems to come out of the tradition of spiritualism, mediums, uh, seances. Why? Well... This is why this is this is what I'm thinking right now. It's, okay. Uh, so, here is a chart of uh, medieval how the medieval people thought. Right, you had okay. elements. Right, you have fire, air, water, earth. Right, four. Yeah. The world is made up of four different elements. Right. Right. Um, you can see it's broken down in a couple of the things within the body. There are four elements in the body. Yeah. These elements are completely unrelated to each other. So it's when these elements get out of balance that that things bad things happen, right? So in the body, you know, uh, if you have too much blood, that's why they would bloodlet, right? So if you have too much blood, you gotta let go of some of that blood, right? Right. Um, because these things these things are all independent of each other. Okay, they they need to have a balance in order for certain things to happen. Yeah. But this is the this is the European thinking of the universe. Right. It's absolute. a cyclical way of looking at life. Well, it's, it, I would say it's absolutist. It's right. like um, like if you look at Christianity, right, uh, you have, especially with the Catholic Church, uh -huh. you have a supreme authority. That's the Catholic Church. And they say what goes. And that's it. Right? There's no, <laughs> there's no discussion, right? There's no, there's no, um, you, you, thought is completely straightjacketed in the European mind. Okay. So here is a chart of, uh, I believe this is a chart of how theosophists believed the, the spiritual world worked. Mm -hmm. Okay. There were different planes in, in the spiritual world. There's the physical plane where we mostly live. Then you get at the astral plane, the mental plane. I like how the mental plane is above the astral plane. <laughs> it really elevates thought. It's to something even beyond the spirituality. It's interesting. 
Right, but you can and you can see how in this chart they're bleeding into each other. You see? Yeah. The the physical plane, some of the physical plane is actually in the astral plane. Yeah. Something... Are the colors that they choose to define the plane is that part of it or they just put it there at random? I th I don't know, Chris. <laughs> I don't I don't know much about this chart. This is you know when I was researching this, I was trying to find um I was trying to find a chart that the theosophists were like into. Okay. And this is the best I could come up with. I mean, they the theosophists are uh they're so See, the thing about theosophy and other alternative thought processes like that, alternative schools of thought is they're the opposite of European thought. They're the opposite of Christianity. They're not absolutist. Right. So you know, a lot of theosophists wouldn't even believe in this chart, I'm sure. Okay. Like, like for instance, you have Steiner and Blavatsky who turn their back on mediums at some point. And I'm not sure if they ever warm to mediums, but mm -hmm. at some point they didn't like mediums anymore. Uh, but see, that's, I think that's a good example of how the theosophists are always trying to learn and change and question yeah one thing that i've discovered about the theosophists okay is is this is um so especially in the late in the 1800s late 1800s you have a world that's become dominated by europe yeah and europe is seems like they almost seem like gods to some other civilizations yeah. because they have all this crazy technology that's you know that's indistinguishable from magic you know if you, yeah. if you go with uh the science fiction terminology and who said that chris i forget it's uh, in the marvel movies well i, I think, think it was I like said, it was like well, asimov, asimov. i'm sorry okay, so i think Avin, i would say that uh our science to a different culture would just look like magic right so so you have european culture that's become very dominant all over the world and because of the technology and and because of that, you have almost a Marxist uh, effect where people say, say, well, if the Europeans are this godlike, mm -hmm. are this are this uh, dominant over us, their belief system must be the correct belief system. And so you have during that era a complete pushing aside of anything that's not Christianity. Because the Europeans must be right. It's cultural supremacy. Right. And you see it you see you see it in, in in the age of colonialism, right, with the Bible, right? So you have you have uh priests come and try to convert the natives to Christianity and they bring the Bible with them. And the natives are receptive in from what I've read, are receptive in many cases because of the technological dominance of Europe. Okay? But the irony is Christianity has a lot of faults in yeah. terms of uh in terms of uh philo philosophical thinking. Okay? And Christianity is not necessarily the reason why Europe became dominant. Uh-huh. <laughs> right? But it just so happened to 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 hitch the ride along with with uh with the European colonialists. So people like Blavatsky, what they do is, and I verified this with your friend, Chris. I, I found it in my research, and, and he verified it. Um, what... And the only reason we're not mentioning his name is we, we didn't tell him we were going to. He's a, he's well-known, and I don't like using well-known people's names without their permission first. But he knows quite a lot on Blavatsky. Continue. Well, what people like Blavatsky got interested in is – Eastern religions. So you're talking about like Buddhism, right? Religions of India. Um, and the thing about Buddhism and Eastern religions, a lot of them, many of them, is they're not absolutist like Christianity. Okay? There, there's, there's Buddhist sects that are atheists. They don't believe in God. Okay? There, within many Buddhist sects, dissent and questioning of the authorities questioning of uh, what everybody believes is welcomed. There is there is an atmosphere in many Eastern philosophies and religions of searching, 
that we don't know all the answers, that things are um, not so cut and dried. Okay? So, what do you see here, Chris? <laughs> uh, I see Einstein's theory of relativity. Right. E so, e energy, mass, speed of light. Right. So, Einstein at this time, like 1905, I think is the year his uh, four seminal papers come out. Right. One of them, uh, Einstein uh, calculates this formula. And he shows with this formula, which is totally held up today, that energy, mass, and the speed of light are all related. Okay. Yes. Now, now, see, you see how different this idea is than this. Yes. There's no relation in this between the elements. Everything has its own hegemony. Right. So, in in E equals M C squared, everything suddenly is related. And you've heard um, everything's relative. That comes out of Einstein's work. Right. right. The change is the way that modernism works, going from everything has its own lane to the search for a unified field theory. Somehow, everything. How does everything interact with everything else? Right. So the problem with Christianity is that it doesn't allow for this kind of relationship. Because in the Christian mindset, in the Western mindset, um, things don't bleed into each other. Okay? So you see, Einstein has proven that light is somehow related to mass, which is somehow related to energy. You know, it's like this is this is I mean, if you told if you told like the medieval philosophers this, they would think you were you were totally nuts. You yeah. Know? Um, so it, so. So the physicists of this time are discovering that Christianity in some fundamental way has gotten the physical world wrong. And. And so people like Blavatsky are stepping in and looking towards Eastern religions and discovering that they are speaking more to the way the world is constructed than Christianity. So this is, um, this is another, this is an Einstein thought experiment, right? Um, so you see there's this guy standing here, right? Looking at a train. Right. Imagine the train is traveling. Is Einstein or Heisenberg? This is an Einstein, this is an Einstein thought experiment. So, okay. so imagine that the train is traveling close to the speed of light yeah. and two lightning bolts strike equidistant from the front of the train and the back of the train. Right. So if you're observing this from outside the train, right. you see the lightning bolts hit at the same time. Right. Okay. But if you're on the train and your train is traveling close to the speed of light, mm -hmm. you will see... The, this lightning bolt first, uh -huh. and then you will see the second lightning bolt second, because the light light travels the same speed in every frame. Makes so, sense. So 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 do the lightning bolts. So the question that Einstein had was: Do the lightning bolt? When do the lightning bolts strike? Are they striking at the same time? Or are they striking at different times? Yeah. And his answer is: It depends on where you are. If you are outside yeah. of the train, they're striking at the same time. If you're on the train, they're striking at different times. So it depends on your it depends on your frame of reference. So that's why that's why Einstein says everything is relative. In Christianity, Christianity doesn't allow for that kind of ambiguity in the universe. Right. But Eastern religions do. Eastern philosophies do. Okay, so I would just want to end. So that's my answer, Chris, for why uh, mediums and spiritualism and theosophy figure such a huge part in creating the modern world. It's because the, the modern world is Eastern. It's not Christian. So when the theosophists and other spiritualists look to the Eastern world, okay, they had a better model for the modern world, and they were able to create modernism. And this wow, last one that is, is a fascinating thesis. <laughs> yeah. And this last painting is um, called Eye of the Lord by Georgiana Houghton. And I love this. This is like my favorite of hers, I think. You know, I, I really like the way you, you've pulled in all these divergent uh, aspects of religion, philosophy, art, reality, because it does 
it does seem like what really defines modernity, especially in the visual arts at this, at, as we get into this point in history, is that the artist isn't just reflecting the literal world back to us. And since the artist has always been tasked on some level with depicting the celestial and the heavenly, uh, but always in such a literal way that by opening it up to interpretations that speak to us maybe in more in a, an emotional level or psychological level, or uh, even just speaks to the inherent ambiguity, which speaks to the limitations of our own conceptions. Uh, it's fascinating because this new relationship between art and religion isn't what we, it's not one based on morality or mythos, but is far more curious and far less sure of itself. And maybe it's ambivalence. It's why we relate as human beings so strongly to it. I would like to thank you so much. Randall, uh, I know we have one last installment in the, our painting series. Do you want to cue us up for the next installment? So give them a little teaser. Yeah. So the next episode is just going to be about Hitler's taste in art. And I, I think I've brought, we brought you on the journey now of of how the modern world was made and the problem with hitler and people like that is they're going to reject the modern world they they want to go back to a medieval mindset almost literally and i think we're going to go look we're going to look at some of the art that hitler even made himself and that he liked and you're going to see his state of mind you're going to see his ascetic taste all right well until then i'm chris i'm randall and we'll talk again real soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.